From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Benker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives on men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. The idea that women can have it all is complete BS. Unless you redefine the whole thing to mean this. A happy marriage, healthy kids, and some type of independent passion that you can pursue as a woman. This passion can come in many forms. A hobby that brings you great joy and some extra spending money. Or a flexible career that you can move in and out of as the needs of your family change. If you or someone you know wants a guide for how to do this, just go to SuzanneBanker.com slash podcast and click on the Become a Subscriber button. When you join at the $10 level, you get a 100% free digital guide of how to get hitched and stay hitched, which not only lays out a plan for having a healthy marriage, but also provides the roadmap you need to create a genuinely balanced life. That's SuzanneBanker.com forward slash podcast. So a man asked me recently whether or not he should consider marrying a woman who makes three times what he does. The short answer is no. I would never advise any man to do that. While you and I may know one or two married couples for whom this massive role reversal appears to work, the truth is no one really knows the ins and outs or even the general health of anyone else's marriage. What we do know are the statistics about such marriages. And when we use common sense and human nature as our guide, rather than politics and ideology, we know even more about how these marriages fare. We can see for ourselves, if we pay attention, what it is that men and women really want. Let me tell you about a woman named Susan Foray, a 40-something divorced actuary who wrote an article in the New York Times called How I Fell for an I'm the Man Man. It was about her new relationship with a man who was unlike all the others she had dated in the past in that he believed in traditional gender roles. This gentleman told Foray flat out one day, I'm the man. I should be in charge of the money. Miss Foray felt a jolt of ang- Sorry, I'm going to do that again, Kelsey. Miss Foray felt, quote, a jolt of anxiety. Here she was, an actuary. That's someone who analyzes statistics and uses them to calculate insurance risks and premiums. And the man she's dating tells her that managing money is his job, not hers. Quote, I found his bluntness surprising, but also alluring. He was confident in his desires. And I craved a man who sought to take financial responsibility for his family. Even if I didn't need it. End quote. That's a critical statement right there. She goes on. The men I'd previously dated thought of themselves as staunch feminists. In hindsight, frustratingly so. At least in the sense that they were too inclined to defer to me, under the guise of respecting me, to ever take charge, either financially or sexually. This relationship dynamic Miss Foray describes is not an anomaly. It is the norm today. Countless women are dating or are married to men who, in an effort to appear liberated, have either curbed their ambitions or who simply follows rather than leads. Just the other day, I had yet another conversation with a mother whose 20-something daughter is moving in with a man who lacks the direction and ambition that she has. 
And the daughter told her mom she's worried that he will come to resent her. She's right to be worried. Not necessarily because he will come to resent her, although he might. But mostly because she will come to resent him. A seismic shift has occurred since I personally was on the dating market. But my experience with this phenomenon isn't relegated to conversations with friends. As a marriage and relationship coach, I deal with this new reality every day. The vast majority of my clients are individuals or couples who are grappling with a new sexual dynamic. One in which the woman is the dominant partner. Some think this evens out what they consider to be an uneven playing field and makes women happy. In reality, it makes most of them miserable. And those aren't my words or my opinion. We have the data to pack this up now. It also makes men miserable. But 40 years of feminism has eroded male power to such a degree that many men no longer recognize their own disempowerment, which starts very often in their very own homes. Today, almost a quarter of U.S. children live in single-parent homes. And in the vast majority of those homes, the single parent is the mother. This is detrimental to both sons and daughters, but it's particularly devastating for boys. After all, girls still have their same-sex parent as a model for womanhood, but boys have no such model for manhood. Instead, they're raised primarily by women. Not just at home, but at school, where the majority of their teachers are women. The dearth, and by the way, just back up really quickly, that's not to suggest that girls are, do not suffer from having dads, because they absolutely do, although it manifests itself differently. Um, that it does in boys. So I want to make sure I throw that in there. Also, this is not a blanket statement that all single mother homes are detrimental. But it is to say that not recognizing it at all, that this lack of a father in the home is, is, is uh, um, harmless, is just ridiculous. The dearth of fathers and male leadership combined with a relentless war on men and masculinity, has totally emasculated our men. They've dispensed with their masculine attributes, or perhaps never developed them to begin with, and are now feminized. Naturally, this radically alters the sexual dynamic between women and men. Because rather than being bold, confident, strong, and ambitious, as men were raised to be in the past when dad was around, Men tend to now be tentative and accommodating. They look to women for answers and await their instructions. And far too many of them have stopped making something of themselves altogether. The unfortunate result of this when it comes to relationships is that women aren't interested in those men, and the men don't often understand why. After all, they've become the liberated men they were asked to become. But in doing so, something was lost. It's one thing to encourage people to be flexible with sex roles, and another to suggest that biology is bogus. Men and women are not interchangeable. Therefore, the idea that they can seamlessly reverse roles is just wishful thinking. Men's and women's bodies are literally made to fit together like two puzzle pieces. A relationship that honors these sex differences, not just physically but psychologically, will flourish. A relationship that doesn't will die. It's true that the average marriage today, my own included for the record, is more egalitarian than were our parents' and grandparents' marriages. Birth control, technological advances, remote workspaces, and a shocking array of household conveniences have made all this inevitable. So very few homes, when you look inside them, look anything like Leave it to Beaver. Not that they ever really did. That was just TV. But, it, you know, 
as far as that image goes, that's not what we're talking about here. And very, very few homes are ever going to function like that. But when couples become parents, this is important. Something happens. It's, it's one thing when you have a relationship or you're married prior to having kids, but once the kids come along, they begin, the parents begin to divvy up tasks according to their biological proclivities. Indeed, a mere 32% of married women prefer to work full-time. 32% of married women prefer to work full-time when they have kids. The rest want to work, the rest want to work part-time or not at all. This is not the case for men who view breadwinning very differently than women do. Take a moment with me to consider the most significant difference between the sexes. It is women, not men, whose bodies have the ability to do the most important and powerful task in the world. Carry life, give life, and nourish life. Women are even designed to nurture their babies in a unique and primal way. A woman's value to society, in other words, is immeasurable even if she never earns a dime. That is not the case for men. A woman's identity is linked to her desire to nest. That this is not true of every woman does not make it any less true for most. Any gynecologist can tell you that most women, if they haven't had children by their mid-30s, become anxious. No matter how committed they may be to their jobs, that desire is there. And when it's met, a woman's nurturing gene kicks in. Providing for that child emotionally, not financially, will be her first instinct. A man's first instinct, or perhaps I should say a father's first instinct, is to make money. That is his unparalleled accomplishment in the same way giving birth is to a woman. Thus, when a man isn't providing for his family in a manner that he deems necessary, he will not be happy, and neither apparently will she. As Miss Foray observed, women crave a man who takes financial responsibility for his family, even if they don't technically need him to. Sexual attraction depends on a woman's ability to rely on a man, even if she's capable of relying on herself. That's the missing element in this push of the so-called equal marriage. By suggesting men and women are essentially the same, we set them up to fail. We ignore biology at our peril. That's what happened to a client of mine I'll call Jane. That's not her real name, but trust me, she's a very real person. Jane is a physician who makes over $350,000 a year. And her husband, who, as it happens, has an MBA, so he's clearly Jane's professional equal, has been home with their four children since they were born. Neither one is happy. This role reversal has caused enormous conflict, Jane says. I'm jealous of the fact that he gets to stay home, and he's jealous of the fact that I get to go to work. I lack respect for him because I'm bringing home all the money. I regret that I'm not an at-home mom and wife, supporting my family instead of leading them. End quote. Their situation is very real, and it's not uncommon. And again, a caveat to say that's not always going to be, um, like, for example, I know, because I know their story, and they're not alone in this. I've heard it many times, where because women and men are making so much money to, well, because women are making so much money, more often than men, and if they're married, once they're married, and and they have kids, they often determine that she should be, he should be the one to stay home if she's making more. So they base this decision exclusively on finances. Well, it's just logical. Whoever makes more should be the one to stay in the workforce while the other one stays home. And and I get it because they've been groomed to think about money, 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 money in every possible way. Like it's the number one thing in their life that making it, um, making decisions based on it. Like everything is just putting money at the top with, no understanding how this is going to affect them down the line. And that was the case with Jane, who I, she might be listening. I think she's a pretty avid listener and I know she's nodding along. Um, the reality is no one said, Hey, you might be making more right now, but if you start down this path and he's not able to find his way back into the workforce or it takes him a long time and he's not earning for a long period of time, it's going to shift your dynamic 
because it's just going against the way we're made. Now, does it, do all people end up with the same result? No, but most do. And that's enough to warn, it seems to me, people not to do it if possible. For decades, women have been groomed to be like men and men have essentially responded by coming more like women. And this role reversal may get women ahead at the work in the, in the marketplace, but it's in love. It's a complete disaster. Successful relationships depend on men being allowed to be men and on women being allowed to be women. Every fiber of a woman's being calls out for a man on whom she can feel physically and emotionally safe. And money is part of that equation. Yes, women now earn their own money and that's not going to change. But what can change is our attitude and approach to marriage and relationships. Being malleable with gender roles is great, but ignoring biology is not. Move with the biological tide rather than against it, and you will very likely succeed. Move against it, and it just doesn't want to work. So whatever happened with Susan Foray and her guy? Quote, sitting with a glass of wine, I was tempted to minimize the implications of his beliefs on gender roles. I pondered him being in charge of the money. Unlike my ex, he was frugal, believing a car was for transportation, not luxury. His home was outfitted with charming furniture he had made for himself. But he wasn't cheap when it came to me. He paid when we went out. I never even offered, in part because I knew doing so would displease him, but also because I relished feeling cared for. He was fiscally responsible, generous, and trustworthy. I told myself there was nothing wrong with the man being in charge of the money as long as he made good decisions. At the, to- at the same time, I found myself being guarded around my new guy, evading his questions and hiding things I thought he wouldn't like. When he asked if I ever went to church, I said no, but failed to mention that I was Jewish. I never lied about my career, though I didn't tell him the whole truth either. He knew I was an actuary, but not that I was a partner at the firm. Despite my evasiveness, I knew what I loved about him. A few years earlier, a dog had attacked his son. He fought off the dog, but his son was left with stitches and difficulty sleeping. He sued the neighbor who owned the dog, getting a sizable contribution to his son's college fund, and the neighbor moved away. Given the choice between a man who said all the right things about supporting a strong woman and a man who shielded his child from a vicious dog with his bare hands. I choose the latter. But in the end, he didn't choose me. It seemed like an obvious decision, but I surprised myself by bursting into tears. What he had offered, strength, protection, and generosity, were things I'd been looking for without even knowing it. That's the thing about gender roles. They can meet a need you were afraid to acknowledge and they can take it all away when you don't conform. End quote. And that is why I would never encourage any man to marry a woman who makes considerably more than he does. I would warn him instead of what's likely to come if he does. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it if you'd take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. If you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about The Suzanne Banker Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.